Hello, everybody. So we're working things out right now. We just want you to get a little bit more comfortable to the front rows. If you're in the fifth, sixth, seventh row, we kind of need you to move on up, fill in these gaps right here in the middle. When our cameras go live, we want it to look like it's really full in the room, even though we know what it is. All right? <laughs> so we'll be starting shortly. Just be patient with us. Thank you very much. All right. All right, folks, welcome. How you doing? All right, then. Glad to be here in Memphis, National Civil Rights Museum, uh, for uh, a great conversation that we've been actually having all day, uh, dealing with, uh, of course, uh, truth-telling. Uh, here we are, 50 years after uh, today, the anniversary, of course, 
uh, two sanitation workers uh, who were killed uh, here in Memphis uh, that led to the sanitation worker strike, which of course what brought, brought Dr. King uh, to Memphis. And so uh, we remember then earlier today there was a wreath laying ceremony uh, that took place. Uh, our cameras were there and we actually captured that and live streamed that. And, uh, so in addition to the commission uh, hearing Barry's testimony, hearing uh, folks speak about uh, all, of course, all of the different uh, issues then and now. Now we want to have uh, a further conversation uh, here today. So I want to bring up our panel. And so I've got the lucky names right here. So first up, Reverend Joanne Watson, step on up. There's no table, so uh, you don't have to keep it. It's okay. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Gina Stewart. All right, William Bill Lucy. He'll be, yeah, he'll be, he'll be, he'll be joining us uh, in uh, a second. Uh, Kedron Franklin, Coalition of Concerned Citizens. All right, they're coming as well, okay. And Reverend Doc, Dr. Angelique Walker Smith, Senior Associate for Pan African Orthodox Church, Engagement at Bread for the World. Lord, you got a double sided uh, uh, business card right there. Also, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. You can't have a pound unless you have an alpha man on it. So, yeah. you know, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Y'all can take a seat. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm an alpha too. Yes. Right. So, again, glad to be here. Glad to be here. Um, first off, um, here we are operating in 2018, and a poll was done by, a, okay, we got to figure out what's up with the microphones. So is it the lavalier or is it the handheld? It's the lav, okay? So is it a battery issue or what? The scratching is killing me. So come get this lav. If I'm using the handheld, that's fine. Just come take this lav. Turn it off myself. There we go. All right. The poll was done, and the question was asked, who do you follow, if you will, in terms of uh, leadership? And the Black Lives Matter movement, which is barely four years old, when it came to Gen Xers, Millennials, Gen Y, more of them said they were following the leadership of Black Lives Matter than traditional civil rights organizations. This is the first time in our history that the black church was not leading a movement. Can the black church, from your perspective, follow and not lead? Anybody can answer that question. Y'all were like, they didn't give me that on the cheat sheet. <laughs> See, I, I don't follow the questions they give me. I come up with my own. We know this. <laughs> That's why you Roland Martin. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, Roland, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the black church to regain its prophetic witness, but this time in partnership with Black Lives Matter, in partnership with those who have picked up the prophetic mantle in many instances when we've been sitting down. And so I don't see it as a bad thing. As a matter of fact, I see it as a good thing because we get amnesia and forget that the civil rights movement, SNCC was a youth-led movement. Even SCLC, when King started, what, was not even 30 years old. And so a lot of times we have this historical amnesia that makes us forget the role of youth in the civil rights struggle. And keep in mind that during the civil rights struggle, the National Baptist Convention, the largest Baptist denomination, was not on the front lines. And so the church has always had to negotiate, are we going to be out front or are we going to be in the role of the supporting cast? I also think there's a gender analysis here. The narrative doesn't point to women leading, but we were leading during the Civil Rights Movement and before that. We have to correct the narrative. And Black Lives Matter has had a prominent role for women today. 
So I think that legacy continues and we need to learn from the non-corrective narrative from the past and correct it so that we can learn what works today. In either case, particularly in the case of women, women, whether they're inside of the institutions or so-called outside of the institutions, have been leading because they do have a vision of faith, whether they're inside the institution or outside of it. So I think today we're seeing something similar. I see a lot of young women who are women of faith, as well as in the days, days past. So I see some consistency there, particularly around the gender issues, but we have to correct the narrative. I see it as uh, historically relevant because the truth is there has never been a time when there's always been complete harmony uh, among black people in the black church. Uh, when you consider that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was uh, put in a position where he had to start uh, the Progressive Baptist Convention because the National Baptist Convention was saying quit marching, quit protesting. No, no, they got kicked out. Oh, come on, well, hey. But it was because of his activism. So he was put in a position where you, you want to have black church support, you start your own. And that's, uh, you know, when, when Reverend Dr. C.L. Franklin, Aretha's father, hosted uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Detroit, June 63, when he first said, I have a dream, some other black preachers got jealous of Reverend Franklin and told Dr. King not to come. Uh huh. But the same Negroes on the front row once King came, uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to be on, on camera. So there's never, there's never been complete harmony on that. You can jump in. Well, I would say in reference to your question, whether or not the church can uh, lead or follow, I think the answer is both. I think there have been times that the church has had to follow because of our apathy and our tendency to watch from the sidelines. When we look back over history, we'll find that in many instances, as Reverend Watson has already indicated, it was the black church. The black church was not, was not immediately uh, supporting King. We have King's picture over our mantles, but when we really read the history and the entire story, we know that there were some instances. What me? <laughs> Truth telling a start. What me? Create issues. So I think that the black church has led and has followed. And I think that's one of the reasons why in many instances we have um, the groups like Black Lives Matter and others, because we have lost our prophetic voice in some cases, and this season that we're in is challenging us to reclaim that. One of the things that, that, that I have talked about a lot uh, over the last decade or so uh, is that when we talk about, Bill, organizing and mobilizing, um, I don't like to recreate stuff. Uh, I like to go assess what we have in terms of, in terms of uh, mass reach and how we can move. And what's, what's very interesting to me is that when we think about our institutions, our largest institutions, I would say the most sophisticated infrastructure the black community has is its fraternities and sororities. So here's what I mean by that. They're international in scope, they have international leadership, national, they have regional leaders, state leaders, grad chapters, undergrad chapters, and initiatives that work with high school students, right. middle school, and um, uh, elementary school students. One of the presidents can push a button, it goes to the entire leadership. Do you believe, not only when it comes to fraternities and sororities, but our other institutions, that we haven't fully maximized our organizations with massive capacity We've thought way too small when it came to mobilizing and organizing when it came to social action. Your thoughts? Here, here's, here's what I think, and this really comes from uh, experience. Uh, I think as, as a broad organization, we think too small. And, and, and by virtue of that, even if we succeed 100%, we only do something small. Uh, I think we got to figure out how to do large things. A and I would agree with you in terms of the structure of institutions. The, the problem is that our lives are always impacted by crises of one kind or another. Um, that if you got to go back and talk to a board and it's got to talk to another board and it's got to do the trickle down thing, the, either the person or the people you're trying to help 
that problem has either overwhelmed them or they have given up on it. Uh, we need to have the ability to exercise power yeah. uh, at a local level that can change whatever the conditions are that is affecting this person or this family. A and, and in many cases, we're fearful of doing that. Um, we think about who's going to be mad if we do this, uh, as opposed to how many people are affected and impacted positively if we do this. And, and I admire the fraternity brothers and the structure and all that, but it takes too long. Uh, the NAACP has a structure in virtually every little small town you can think of, but by the time you run something up the chain mm -hmm. and it comes back down, uh, you can say, we need some marches to help out there. Well, we got to get the regional structure to think yeah. about it. And, and by the time it gets back down, the question is, maybe we'll do it. Well, the people who are being affected, they can't deal with maybe. And so I, I think we got to figure out a way to get our active message and commitment to involvement to the point where it responds. Speed. Speed. So, but I don't even necessarily think we even look at our numbers and, 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 and realize the reach. I'll give you an example. So, uh, 2011, Ohio passed one of the most onerous voter suppression laws in the country. That was then an effort to collect more than 300,000 signatures to put it on the ballot uh, in 2012. So I'm moderating a session at Congressional Black Caucus with Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, uh, and it was a Panhellenic panel. And uh, I got there a little bit late, so when I arrived, I said, I asked them, they, everybody was talking about oh, our voter education program, voter registration, I was kind of like, gotcha. So I asked all nine presidents and the Panhellenic president about this Ohio initiative. Nobody had any idea what I was talking about. So. I look at Congresswoman Fudge and she's telling me, move along, and I go, no. <laughs> and I stayed with it and I start pressing them and everybody's quiet, everybody's quiet, everybody's quiet. So finally, they were like, okay, he's kicking our butt too long. So they said, we get a panel in the council meeting tomorrow, we're gonna discuss it. So here's what they, the next day, they went back and they counted that there were 120 Divine Nine chapters in Ohio alone. 120 across the state. So this year, and first of all, the signatures, uh, they did get the signatures, and they, they voted, removed that whole law because they didn't want to get defeated at the ballot box. But here's what's interesting. State Representative Alicia Reese is trying to get the Ohio Bill of Rights, has had virtually no luck with labor organizations, uh, with, with uh, ACLU, all kinds of different people. Handful of volunteers, they raised $30,000, they got 100,000 signatures, this would enshrine the right to vote in the state constitution. So no more lawsuits every year when it comes to Ohio. AK is on the only group that has, as a, as a body in the state, said we're going to help get the signatures. She's had a difficult getting black churches and other organizations to say we got to get behind this initiative to get the signatures. That to me is, a, is an example of, we're talking about social and racial justice and economic justice, where you can utilize your existing infrastructure to get this one thing accomplished, which is a major thing, and this sister's having a difficult time trying to get black institutions to use their power to get the signatures. That to me, Bill, is a huge thing that could have major ramifications the folks are thinking small, not realizing if each group or each chapter says we're going to collect 500 or 1,000 signatures, you can hit the 300,000. Yeah. So for uh, anyone can jump in. How do we get folks to do what Bill said, to think big? Not just act fast, but to think big and not just think, well, we're going to have that protest down the street, but think in terms of ballot initiatives. By the way, give it up for the brothers and sisters in Florida they did collect the more than one million signatures. It will be on the ballot in November in Florida to restore the right to vote for the formerly incarcerated. <laughs> they did it there. So just anybody can jump in. How do we get for our, our folks to begin to think that big with our organizations and our infrastructure? Anybody? You need change in leadership. <laughs> you need young people, uh, those persons who are active on social media, uh, persons who are in touch with the community, 
who don't have to be telegraphed what the issues are. They need to not wait to react to what the uh, organization leaders are not doing, but go inside and take it over. Uh, join. 50 members is all you need in order to take full control of most of the branches. So I would not wait to react, uh, be a part of the leadership, be, be make the difference. So you're you saying now think. that don't even think about trying to start your own, take over an organization with existing infrastructure and history. Absolutely. That, that's what Nakima Levy Pounds did in Minneapolis. Yeah. The young folks there got tired of the NAACP. They said, mm -hmm. okay, so we're going to figure out. I mean, I get uh, mm -hmm. and I, I'm with them because I was trying to get them to do that with the South Side branch of NAACP in Chicago 10 years ago. <laughs> well, they went in, they brought in, they owned by 75 members, then they ran, they ran our own slate for the election. They didn't realize what happened. They voted everybody out. That's how she became president. They took it over. That's exactly what should happen. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Go ahead. In terms of, in, in, uh, and how have you tried to do it within your own organizations to get people to think big? Let me, say, let me share this, uh, two things. Number one, Ta-Nehisi Coates did a piece where he quoted a response to Barack Obama. Barack Obama has, of course, the Our Brothers Keep, My Brothers Keeper piece. And so he spoke to a young cat who had gone, gone up through the mentoring program, and he said, what do you want me to tell legislat le legislators when I get back to D.C.? The brother said, all of this is good, but I've got to go back to an environment that contradicts everything you poured into me. And we've got to start thinking in terms of transforming environments. Mentoring is cool, but if you don't transform the environment that the kids go back into, the sad reality is you've set them up in a real sense to almost go back into what they left from and return the same way. So my thing is, let's think in terms of environment. Roland said something, I say it behind his back, so I'll say it to his face, he spoke at our national convention in Baltimore and killed it. And he messed me up with this statement. He said to the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, you brag on the fact that when you were in school, you ran the yard. How many of you now run your city? It's easy to talk about what you did on the yard, but now you need to translate that and grow up and start running your city. And so that became our challenge in Dallas. And every meeting I go to, I bring up your speech. How are we going to run this city? We run the city by transforming the environment. And we run the city by learning from Black Lives Matter instead of hating on Black Lives Matter because what they've done that's absolutely brilliant is gotten rid of all of that structural nonsense nonsense that gets in the way of aggressive, visionary, creative leadership, and so they are about an agenda and not so much a structure. All right. Anybody can jump in. Go ahead. I don't have to call I, on I you. I was about to, to footnote uh, what Freddie just said. They stopped waiting for permission, <laughs> and they took matters into their own hands right. and did what needed to be done. I heard someone say at the Proctor Conference about two years ago, one of the um, spokespersons for B Black Lives Matter, she was addressing this issue that the Black Lives Matter had been criticized for not having leadership. And she said, we don't need Martin. We are Martin plus 10. You know, in other words, they've taken the, the matters into their own hand and did what needed to be done because bureaucracy often undermines progress. But also, folks, are, people also forgot that uh, it, it was Martin and it was Roy Wilkins and it was Whitney Young it was Dorothy Height, uh, it was James Farmer, uh, it was, it was, it, you can, it was a whole line. Chief, chief, and I think, and, 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 now, and not only that, what people also remember, forget, you had national organizations, but who also respected local organizations who were already on the ground, because you could talk about King, but you can't ignore Nixon in Birmingham and Shuttlesworth in Birmingham, because that was, the, you, you had stuff already there for them to walk into, not like it was all, cre all, all created. Uh, so I think a lot of times we, we actually miss that. I, I want to stay on this point in terms of thinking big, and, I, and so I'm going to go down the line and, and for each person. Um, what do you think, you can pick whatever issue, I don't care what category, and that we should be thinking big in order to make change? One area, one issue that you want to see us to think big about changing something. That's a lot. That's a lot. Just one. Just one. 
uh, one of the things that automatically comes up to mind for me is the, the economics because right. it's, it's interrelated with so many other things. It, it, it's a trickle effect on how a lot of other things are, are how we are oppressed, for one. And, and as I was thinking about how do we, how do we expound out on getting the message to the masses and moving the so-called masses uh, by utilizing certain social organizations like the AKAs or the fraternities or the sororities, um, a, a lot of it comes down to messaging. A lot of it comes yep. down to you know, if I can relate with what the person's saying, then I get behind it. If not, then I'm, I'm gonna watch from afar. One of the things we found troubling is a lot of people expect the message to come from someone, you know, suited up like Mr. Lucy, and, <laughs> and, and, or, or that's a pastor. And that doesn't traditionally work for down south or organizing people down south because a lot of people who's speaking up are the ones affected by the issues that's, that's playing yeah, but, in but our city. Ella Baker also told the folks, take your suits off when you went down south you put on overalls. You have, to, you have to be able to take your suits off and, and, and also put them on. So you said, so you said economics, and so here's one of the things that, that I, I hit me when I ran Chicago Defender, then I'm gonna go, go to that side and come back. Mm -hmm. uh, so you up next with your, with your big thing. So a big, we said for economics big. This is what I think is big. 100,000 African Americans saving $1,000 a year <laughs> by being able to get mutual funds, let's say through an aerial, because you could do as little as $50 a month. Uh, if you hit that number, that means that's $100 million black folks would have invested in one year. Yep, 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 yep. Now, again, somebody is thinking, okay, yeah, but that's a lot. No, it's $82 a month. That's it. <laughs> now, what it does is, because first of all, if the average black family has $5,000 in savings, and you save $1,000 a month, hell, you don't hit 20% of what, uh, what the average is just in one year in terms of total, total, total wealth. That's an example, and I've given this to other organizations, I'm like, look, y'all more than free to run with it to be able to do that. Uh, so whether it's that or whether it's Eddie Brown's, and the reason I'm saying Ariel or Eddie Brown, those are two African Americans who own mutual fund companies. Uh, so not only are you taking black dollars, but you're investing them in black companies that actually have mutual funds. Uh, but that's an example, that's big. How do you, that, again, that's 100 million in a year. There's a small, it's funny you brought that up, there's a small model that I actually have been working on utilizing myself where you take 30 people, start and small. You take 30 people, uh, $333, that's $10,000. Y'all can create a $10,000 business right there that can eventually grow. But like you said, if you think big. And you say y'all have done that? That's something that we're actually working on. Okay. In the process of working on. So you're trying, you're trying to get, uh, explain it again. 30 people at $333. That's ten thousand dollars with the right structural business. Like right now, we have a see-through land cooperative. That's a worker-owner cooperative. So everybody that works there owns the, the, the has the same amount of stake in the company. So okay. there's no one CEO. Everybody wins, you know. And so everyone's looking after the business. As so you had that owned. cooperative. Yes. How long have you had that? A year now. Gotcha. Yes. So if somebody wants to find out how y'all did that. Where can they get? How, where can they get information on it? C3 Land Cooperative. You actually check it out on Facebook. Our website is being developed as we speak right now. But it's now. called C3 Land <coughs> Cooperative. Cooperative. Yes. Uh, yes. And it's on Facebook. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Cool. Your big one. Big one. Reparations. Reparations. <laughs> so Our people. So are define it. Define that. There is a debt owed to Africans who live in the United States of America because it was Africans who built the wealth of this country. I'm not just talking about the South. The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States, and the money that was used to pay for the Louisiana Purchase that doubled the USA size came from profits from the slave trade. And it came as a result of Napoleon losing to Toussaint Louverture in Haiti. So they had to recoup some of their losses, so they sold uh, what were French holdings, and that became uh, the second half, the western half of the United States of America when you consider how the stock market, how universities, how major levels of trade, how wealth in this country was built on the backs of Africans who never got paid, never got respect, were lynched and tortured, drawn and quartered, killed for trying to learn to read and write, raped and robbed. So are you, so, so we are you, old, so I say. So but, but follow me your big idea. So, for folks, anybody who's listening, they're saying, okay, well, how do I do it? Are you, are, are you, are you telling them to go the federal level, the state level, the city, the county level? 
uh, all levels. We'll start with the federal government because the federal government has already paid reparations to uh, several, several groups, all of which are worthy, but no group is more worthy than Africans in America. And all you need is a critical mass. I know that there are some people who don't love themselves like they should Got of it. Africa, but they don't want to honor their ancestors who built this country. And that's okay. They, they can turn it down. But it's a debt owed, and we ought to come together. Critical mass ought to come together to demand reparations. When we make the demand, when we make the demand, we'll get it. Bill, big, your big idea. I think I'd like to find a way for our broad community to understand the power that it has now. Um, Hold the mic up a little bit. Uh, we go. We're going to be faced with massive job creation. That's going to happen. The question is, are we ready to be at the table to get our share of what's coming? And I say that just based on the politics of the nation. There is going to be an infrastructure bill right. that will create millions of jobs. The question for us, are we prepared to be a part of that discussion? Okay, so now I, I want, we're going we're to keep going with that. So how do you get someone to listen to what you just said when they're saying, man, nobody had better sit at the table with Donald Trump? Tuesday, he even Tuesday when he met with the TV anchors, there were black people who were saying, Roland, you got to invite it. Man, don't go. First of all, Lester Holt was in the room. I invited Derek McGinty. I was in the room. Yamish Alcindor, those are the only four black people in the room. Yamish was new. Derek was invited by me. Last year, it was just me and Lester. So people would say, don't even sit at the table. But if you don't sit at the table, they you can't do what you just said. What do you tell them? Well, well, let me premise my point on this. You know, w w we can't continue to live with the action that Trump is a racist. That's a given. I mean, we're beyond <laughs> that. Uh, nor can we condemn the rest of the country of saying that, you know, everybody who voted for Trump is a racist. That just ain't true. I believe every racist who voted voted for Trump. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm clear on that. But, but w w our battle now has to be with institutions that can impact the decisions that are made with regards to where money is spent, where jobs are created. And I, I think only on my own, myself, as a trade unionist, uh, they're going to get their share of those jobs. Our question is, how do we impact the union so that the end result be is beneficial to us, too? Uh, I, I will share a story with you. At Katrina, uh, that was a massive jobs program. Houston is a massive jobs program. Florida, Puerto Rico, those are massive jobs programs. Where are we? in that process. And let me share an example. I, I, I bigged up on $4 billion with Katrina. And, and we talked to the institution about how to spend that. We suggested that here is an opportunity to bridge a wide divide among African American communities through the church. Uh, that we ought to talk to the church about using their congregations to supply workers to do the repair, rebuild, and rehab work. Uh, that's the goal and opportunity to build two things, a political alliance and also an economic alliance. Uh, the unions are going to be at the table when the infrastructure jobs are given out. Uh, we got to get out of the business of saying, well, my uncle couldn't get a job 40 years ago because of the union. Well, if that's still relevant to you, uh, hang with that. But there are people in our communities who need jobs. And if jobs are going to come, whatever process they get there, we ourselves are preparing and we're using the models through the NAACP. It's economic development mechanism to train them how to participate in what we call project labor agreements, where the community has a voice in the expenditure of funds for capital improvement projects. We're going to build some highways. They're going to build some dams and some railroad and railway system. We got to figure out how to get to the table, and when we get to the table, not be dealing with RR. 
<laughs> so, so no, 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 I'm, I'm gonna go to you. I'm gonna go to you, but I want to ask one more thing. So, uh, the CDC, <laughs> the CBC, some of y'all like, what did he just say? <laughs> yeah, y'all, y'all caught it. Y'all caught it. All right. <laughs> so the CBC had an initial meeting with Trump. Then they sent a letter saying, well, they they got nothing happened from that, so they canceled the second meeting. I argued on my uh, former show, TV One News One Now, that they should have went to the second meeting. And then what they should have said is, let the camera stay mm -hmm. That's right. and leave them all on That's right. or we'll leave. Right. That's right. And then negotiated, questioned, pressed right there. So just like when he did that meeting he had with, with his cat, what, when, uh, when they were talking about uh, uh, immigration bill, I, I said, that's what you do. They all come in and say, no, 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 let the camera stay for our whole meeting. That's right. So if you're talking about this in the job bill, would you tell CBC Chairman Cedric Richmond and the CBC, look, this, this thing is going to happen. You're the largest block in the House of Democrats. Be at the table and demand we get our fair share. That's would you right. tell them that? I'm not convinced that my dealings are with Trump. My dealings are with the institution that I can have some direct impact with. The CBC has a relationship with labor that's a unique relationship. On labor's behalf, it has, what, 45 votes on any given issue? That's where the dealing ought to take place. And then let the movements as institutions deal with Trump. So you're saying, if you're the Black Caucus, call those labor unions in and say, uh, let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation about how we uh, divide up this coming pie. Okay. And I guarantee you, if you got 45 votes on every issue. You got 48. Uh, 48. I, I, I yeah, agree. it's all good. Uh, you, you've got some power that is alive and well, as I said to the brother just a while ago, there are two kinds of power, real and imaginary. Uh, you ought to use it, whichever one works. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I trust me, uh, I'll be texting us, uh, Congressman Richmond, about your idea. All right, give me your, yeah. your big idea. So my big idea was embodied earlier today at the uh, hearings that we had, and that is to say we have global partners. We have groups and coalitions globally that we can align with. We need to think about the economy being a global economy, not just a domestic economy. It's a global economy. And we have new allies at the global levels who we can engage to further our agenda. One of those places is the UN Decade in Solidarity with People of African Descent, which is where our report will go from earlier today. That is another step in the direction that I'm speaking of. Now related to that are also what are called the Sustainable Development Goals. We had the Millennial Development Goals with the UN, and we did make progress relative to economic development and all the rest of social development. Now we have the Sustainable Development Goals. Unlike the Millennial Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals are for domestic in the West as well as the globalized community outside of the West. They apply here. We are supposed to be right now given that it was signed under the last administration implementing the sustainable development goals in our U.S. context. We're backstepping. Our president backstepped on the Paris Climate Agreement. He backstepped on a few other things in our global alliances that were furthered in the last administration. We need to talk about how we maintain our commitment to the millennial development goals that affect us as well as the world community. Now, one of the concrete ways we do that is look at the issues of land. My brother here was just talking about the trust and the cooperative that he's working on. We have this amazing history of some people of African descent having land in our communities. Now, we've given up a lot of the land or it's been taken from us, from enterprise zones and all the rest. But how do we reclaim the wealth of our land ancestry? Some of us, like myself, are inheritors of what it is we received generations ago and we've come north and we have forgotten or we don't want to go back necessarily to that land base but how do we reclaim that buy new land and have our own developments and have cooperatives that's one of the key pieces that ties us together with the global economy you look at Africa it's all about the land it's all about wealth creation when you have land you have wealth mm -hmm. So we need to think about an economic strategy that is driven around the issues of land, 
and our global alliances to move our economic agenda for forward. Freddie, thinking big, what's your one big one? Well, I'll, I'll stay with the uh, economic thing, and that is that, and again, from the black church perspective, that the black church sees itself not only as the spiritual hub of a community, but as the economic incubator of businesses in the community. And I'll give you this. Uh, what we do at the church, we have this thing called West Wall Street, Friendship West, West Wall Street, in honor of Black Wall Street. And so every year, uh, several times a year, we literally have businesses from the church and the community to set up. And in between our first and second service, and after the second service, they set up Black Expo Light. Now, hold on one second, because you went past something real quick there. Okay. Was, you said from the church and the community. Right. Which means that you didn't just limit it to folks to church in members. the church. Right. Go ahead. Right. And so as a consequence, now it's become so big that the Sunday before, what, Black Friday, we celebrate Black Sunday. And as a consequence, you have black businesses now who are trying to reserve time with us on Black Sunday. We, we have Valentine's Day coming up. Valentine's Day is already the Sunday before Valentine's Day. You get your sweetheart presents from black businesses. And so the idea is, is if every church would open up its doors on Sundays when you have a captive audience and say, after church, we're going to shop with one another. We're going to eat with one another. We're going to basically reinvest in the community. And as a consequence, you're creating that dollar turnover. Not only that, but one of the things that uh, we're losing ground on, we've lost ground on, is besides being consumers and uh, not producers, uh, it shows up in many of the areas where we are making other folk rich. One of the things that a brother came to the uh, last West Wall Street, and his whole thing was, I'm trying to sell weaves, and I'm trying to get sisters weaves, but the thing is, sisters would rather go to Asians who won't hire us, Asians who do not treat us right, they disrespect us, and so he just said, Pastor, it's one thing to have these businesses where we're, you know, selling our, you know, skills. The other piece is we got to produce. And if we're not producing, we're not creating economic wealth. Big one. Big one. I would say economic justice. Uh, the conversation all day today has been about economic injustice. And one of the things that I've been emphasizing uh, to our members this year is the importance of creating our own wealth. I was in Ghana a couple of years ago, and anyone who's ever been to Ghana knows that you can buy anything on the street. Caskets, <laughs> plantains, radios, televisions. How, how many people have been to Ghana before? Raise your hand. You can buy what it is. Y'all know. They have a, and, and the point that I'm making is that they have a hustle. Even though the, uh, the government uh, does not support and undergird programs and things of that nature. They have not allowed that to stop them. And so while we know that there are issues uh, that certainly affect us and that disproportionate, the, the disparities are, have been deadly for African Americans and people uh, who've been twice kissed by nature's son. We also know that in some of the worst of times, those were some of the times that we did our best work. HBCUs were open. Black banks were open. And so economic justice is one of my big ideas, and it's one of the things that I have been particularly emphasizing to our members in this season because we know that the manna has stopped. And along the same lines of what uh, Dr. Uh, Haynes is talking about with his Wall Street, we've instituted something in our church called the Marketplace where we encourage members to... Uh, sell their items, bring their items, and recycle those dollars in our community that we might empower ourselves. Y'all got holy malls. We got holy malls. <laughs> so I, this just up in my head, and we're supposed to talk about economics, and I, and I said a big idea. So I need to get y'all take on this. Weed. Yeah. Weed. <laughs> Let's talk about that. We're now talking about 
California, seven billion dollars. Colorado, Washington State. Uh, before our show got canceled, I interviewed the the, the only sister who uh, was a marijuana dispenser in Maryland. Um, you also have, so you have other states as well. So we've been getting locked up. Now white folks are getting rich of the very thing that we got locked up. Yet, in our community, there's still a lot of people who are saying, hey, man, look, I ain't really down with that. But this thing has exploded. I interviewed Montel Williams, and he uh, has a company and uh, all the different products that they sell. Uh, and there are very few African Americans who are, who, are, who are in this. You said very few legally in it. <laughs> yes, we are talking about the legal aspect of it. <laughs> but, 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 but this is a perfect example of a new industry that we are not necessarily in it, even though we've been in it. <laughs> Have you had any conversations with folks about this? And how are you dealing with this conversation? The folks who say, man, I'm not really sure about that. This is going to be a $100 billion industry. It is going to happen. Will we watch, will we watch this thing go right past us and be shut out again of a new slash old industry. I'd love to get anybody's thoughts on it. Well, go ahead. I, w I would like to touch on this subject, being uh, someone who has been arrested for weed, you know, at 19 years old, you know, arrested for weed that I also had have on my record that people look at, you know, and so how it affects me even today, people look at it and say, oh, you, you know, if I apply for a job, they see this weed charge because we're in the struggle, and so I fell into selling weed. You know, it, it was the one of the quickest options for so-called black people to actually self-organize themselves out of poverty, you know. Um, and so I still to this day, I think about now that weed is being legalized in certain states, uh, how the people who's in position now to be able to grab hold of that market and, and continue to suppress us in such ways because we can't afford to even save up enough money to get a dispensary, you know? Uh, if you un un unless, unless we do what you said earlier. Unless you use col uh, uh, lose uh, collective cooperative, in terms, terms of right. terms community cooperative, being able to pool resources together. I mean, again, it's, it's there. It's there. So uh, uh, a perfect story. And then the question, as Bill said, are our black caucuses leveraging their power to ensure that piece of the pie is being cut to ensure <laughs> that, that we also getting part of it? Go ahead. Uh, one of the so you know uh, right next door Arkansas, they're legalized and they would be legal to to actually have dispensaries and recreational use and that's right across the bridge. When when is that going to happen? That will be happening by the end of this year, actually. So the state of Arkansas. The state of Arkansas will be legal to yes, yes. <laughs> Some of y'all like I'm about to open me a business. <laughs> hey, we we five minutes. We right I'm across the to, bridge. I'm about to be a business <laughs> owner. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, how far is Arkansas from here? Five minutes. Yeah. Across, across the river. Right oh, yeah, y'all y'all about to, yeah. Y'all yes, yes, like, yes. open the business, live in Memphis. <laughs> all right, but, go ahead. But, but for ju just to kind of pinpoint a, a perfect, just a, a perfect place, a uh, small city, Terrell, Arkansas, is a, and, and I've actually found myself coming into knowing the mayor, you know, a, a, a great black woman who's fought hard for Turrell, a, a city that has no really municipality control, uh, is it, all, you know, in Little Rock, they have to fight for libraries, their school system is not there, they have to fight for just properly work, working, like, uh, power, properly working, you know, water facilities, and it's not there. So you think about this place has 650 people and all the land that we could dream about. You take 650 people and, and, and bring them into a cooperative where they own the land, and these dispensaries won't be able to just stake claim in these cities without making sure everyone in this city who's been struggling for the last 20, 30, 40 years are not getting a piece of their pie before you can start making your hundreds of millions of dollars. So you have ideas like that where we can, like I said, take the land if you want to move in. One example, in Colorado, everybody flocked there when it, when it first sprang open, and, and you have people who's relative to Colorado and Denver who 
who didn't like the idea because you have a lot of people, an influx of people moving here. And so they started messing with the housing. They started messing with certain local situations that people wasn't expecting because you have a massive amount of people now flocking to the city. Economic just boom. Most definitely, most definitely. But it, it, it trickles in certain ways and it affects people who's already been affected because they're not getting a piece of the pie. And so uh, anybody else? Because I mean, the, the, reason, the reason this is, this is to me again of interest is because one, you don't have half of your states where it's legal. Mm -hmm. So you literally have this new industry, one that has impacted us in a negative way for the past umpteen years. So in your circles, are these conversations being held and are people looking at this as an economic opportunity or they're avoiding it? Bill, uh, we, go ahead right here. The NAACP at the national board level uh, took up this question of where should it stand on this issue? And after about 18 months of debate, research, analysis, uh, it came out in favor of uh, participating in the, what it, the cannabis industry as they, they, they change the name, you change the impression. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it has potential, as you say, in terms of economic you know, benefit. Uh, we got some reaction from, as you would expect, from religious leadership. Uh, and the debate went in strange directions. Um, and the question was raised, what is the argument against it? Um, and it went from all kinds of strange yeah. things <laughs> uh, to, to unproven logic. Uh, and it was an argument about, well, you can't do this to your body, which is a great argument. But the fact is, it's, it's, it's a reality. Has been for some time. Uh, the question for us is to figure out, is there, are there other reasons other than the economic reasons why we should accept this as a process? Right. And I think that's happening. Right. It's happening. Right. Go ahead. And I would just add this, that we can't come to this space this year and not deal with the justice aspect of this. And that is my man already talked about what he went through. And for me, every one of those states that are getting rich now off of it should have expungement processes in place immediately because there you have in prison the wealth of brothers and sisters who could come out and say, okay, I know how to run it above ground because I've already done it underground. And so I think we have to look not only at the economic aspect, but the justice aspect of it and call for expungement of every sister and brother who found themselves locked up and have their records cleared because of what they had to go through in light of the cannabis industry. Anybody else? All right, I'm just checking. Um, expunge me, Roland. Get, tell him expunge. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Go ahead. But, but you know, the, the, the constituency for expungement is a, is a hill we got to climb, but the, the constituency for sealing of records, uh, seal them so that uh, a brother or sister who's looking for employment, right. the record on that right. issue is sealed and you don't suffer the consequences of having to fight the expungement battle. Right. I, I sit on a, 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 a judicial nomination commission. We nominate judges. Mm -hmm. So the lawyers who come before me, I ask them, what's your view on this? And if you want to be a judge, you're searching around for the right view to have, at least when you're talking to me. <laughs> uh, and and, and the, the judicial system is where our power, our influence has got to be exerted. Because when you say to some of your young brothers who would be, well, it don't matter to me who the judge is, it, it do with you before him. And and that's an area where we got to look at. I say let's seal them or sponge them where we got the power to do it. Right. But at least a sealing gives a brother an opportunity. That's right. Last question for each of these panelists before we switch panels. The world will be here in two months. Um, folks from all over the world will be here. Uh, I would not be surprised if you have uh, 
four of the living presidents who will be here. Um, Trump may very well be here. Uh, no, I'm just, I, I asked him on Tuesday, just letting you know. I did. Um, yes, I did. Yes, I did. It was an off the record meeting. I can't tell you what he said. But I did ask him. Don't think I didn't ask him. Um, Faith, I tell you when we're done. Um, so, all these folks are going to be coming here. What do what would you ask them to do when they leave? They're going to be coming here commemorating so. the assassination of MLK on April Fourth. Hmm. What would you ask them to do when they leave, or what would you even ask them why they're here to do when they leave? commit themselves to transformation of the economic blueprint for everybody in this country, and particularly black people. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his very life at, at, at the tail end of his days trying to uh, lead a poor people's campaign. So if you're going to come to commemorate the tragedy of his murder with the complicity of U.S. government agents who were monitoring everything, and everyone, we need to demand that there be not just a romanticism around Dr. King's life and ideas and the dream, but commit yourself to transformation with respect to people who are without revenue. Commit yourself to do what Dr. King did and make sure that, that we begin to get away from that 1% that is exploiting the 99%. Change that. If you're really honoring Dr. King. All right. I think they need to do what we did today. We had a hearing with the people in Memphis area who have the analysis, have the insight of what hasn't been done since 1968. They need to hear from the same people we heard from today. They need to walk the streets of Memphis and say, this is what America looks like today. And they need to face it, be seen in the community, hear from the community, because when they hear from this community and they walk the streets of Memphis, they're looking at America, the United States of America. And then they need to be put in a room and put into an inquiry. What are you going to do about what was said to you today? in this neighborhood? What about the Crimson Church legacy here? What are you going to do specifically for Memphis, which was the center point in 1968, and thereby what are you going to do to magnify what you're going to do here for this country? Because this is what America looks like. Oh, sorry. Uh, my thing is that everyone commit to living for what King died for. Uh, he came to support striking sanitation workers. He came in the midst of organizing uh, a campaign against impoverishment, poor people's campaign. And so my thing is, how do you have, and William Barber says this, how do you have 26 presidential debates between both parties and not one time was poverty mentioned? Because you got virtually no black moderators, but go right ahead. <laughs> no, for real. No. And so, and so, my thing is, is there, there has been no real commitment to end impoverishment in the world's wealthiest nation. And so, my thing is to come to Memphis, commemorate King and his martyrdom, and not make a commitment to ending impoverishment is a slap in the face of his legacy. Just like, just like uh, all those. Uh, GOP members who were in Selma for Selma 50, right. sitting down front right. uh, talking about uh, all of the foot soldiers, right. and they all went right back, and I told Senator Tim Scott the same thing, they all went right back and refused to even uh, vote on uh, the uh, restoring uh, Section 4 after the Supreme Court uh, pretty much gutted it. I'm like, your presence here is a waste of my time. Uh, go ahead. I would say make this more than a photo op. And when you go back, use your power to do embody the things that King, as Freddie just said, died for. Use your power to make po to create policies and write policies that help the people that King 
came to fight for, that we marched for, and that King ultimately died for. All right. Um, being being that, that civil disobedience voice, we're asking that no one comes to Memphis just to commemorate Dr. King. Um, and if you think that you're going to come to Memphis just to go to a banquet uh, and do that nice uh, thing, then we're letting you know right now that you will be stuck in Memphis. <laughs> it, it may be a, a, an everlasting trip. Uh, <laughs> but we don't plan on representing King in a nice way. We don't plan on representing King in this watered-down way. We really plan on... Or, or I call it the Civil Rights Bobblehead, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, MLK. That, that, that like, like a Civil Rights mascot. That's how America now treats Dr. King. Right. And they, they also treat it as if it was something in the past and it's nothing that's continually going on. So I'm just, and I'm sure we live so people would know that's packing their bags and planning their flights. Um, if you plan on coming down here just, and not getting in touch with the people who's on the ground, like the sister said, understanding the real issues here, understanding that things are not okay in Memphis, uh, we plan on shutting down trains, planes, and automobiles. So I hope you plan on parachuting into <laughs> Memphis because you will not leave Memphis without understanding the real issues in this city. And this goes also for the president if he plans on coming down here. <laughs> Secret Service would not be able to move us out front of their cars <laughs> if they would not be able to leave. So that's something I just want to put out there that we don't plan on anyone coming to this city without understanding, truly understanding what's going on in this city and knowing that it's going to continue to go when they try to bust themselves back out of the city or fly out of the city. You're going to be stuck here understanding what's really going on. So. Now, now, one of the reasons Bill is laughing, y'all, I did an interview with him earlier. Bill, tell him uh, the parking tab you have when you got, stu when you got stuck in Memphis uh, <laughs> in 68. That's one reason why he was laughing. I know that's why you were laughing. You had a flashback. No, I, w I was sharing with um, uh, Roland that when the word came and I was detailed to Memphis and I you know, tried to do the research and the background, it was clear that this thing shouldn't have lasted more than two or three hours. Uh, you had a 100% supported strike of workers. Uh, everybody, uh, in the, everybody was out of the garbage pickup business. I figured just at the rate that garbage accumulates, if you did a little calculation, you picked up 230,000 tons a day. So it wouldn't take long before Memphis was full of garbage. I mean, <laughs> you could figure that out. So the mayor was going to fold this up quick. So I parked at the uh, short-term parking lot in <laughs> Detroit. I, I came back 67 days later. <laughs> 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 So, 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 so the mayor's recalcitrant had a still financial impact on me personally in terms of the pocket. <laughs> uh, let, in, in, in response, because I'm not sure what I could ask you know, folks to do. Um, when, when you look across the globe, uh, life is so complicated for pe people, poor people, in essentially every country you, you visit. And while they may be well intentions to do something and do the right thing, their capacity, their political capacity and commitment to doing what we would want them to do is sort of limited. So I, I have to reserve a view. I, I, if I was going to say anything, those who have the uh, spirit of King to do what they can do in their respective countries with their respective political systems to make life a little bit better for people in need. Uh, our country, I'm not convinced that we've got the political will to attack the problems that exist in our communities. Um, everybody would give us a good speech and they would say, well, we ought to do this and we ought to do that. Um, and everybody recites Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. No, 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 no. They recite the, the bottom of the speech. Oh, no, no, they I'm, ignore I'm, that I'm, top two thirds. I'm, I'm getting that's where I'm that's where I'm going. Oh I can't stand that. They don't they don't tell you them parts where he talk about the check that fails right. to be processed. And, and all of the other problems we have. It's been fifty plus years since that speech. Uh, we could have cured some of those problems. I'm just not convinced we got the political will to do it. So I, I wanna hold off until those who can get here get here <laughs> <laughs> and we see what that crowd look like 
And, and then as you apply your, your community appreciation, those who <laughs> remain, we'll talk to them and see what they're willing to do to get out. <laughs> so. Well, I, I, I w they, they may be doing this, but I, I do have a suggestion for, uh, for Faith and all the folks from the Civil Rights Museum. Uh, I would say anybody who walks through that door cannot walk out unless they drop off a commitment card where they put their name, their address, their information, and what will they commit themselves to do uh, when it comes to what King fought for. Uh, let's see who will fill that card out. And so, right. and I will say, I, I will also require anybody who's gonna be on the microphone, they gotta fill one out too. That's right. And if they don't, tell them they can't speak. I'm just and saying. Leave a check. I'm just saying. <laughs> now I'm just, I'm just. I know I got. That's fine. I got you. But let's see who wanna. Let's see who wanna commit to something. All right, y'all, give it up for our first panel. <laughs> we are going to have an opportunity for the audience to have questions, and so what's going to happen is we're going to bring up our second panel. If you have a question for a particular panelist, and then when you ask your question, we'll just simply hand in the microphone. They can give an answer. Let's bring up our second panel, Dr. William Spriggs, Chief Economist with AFL-CIO. Reverend Dr. James Forbes, Senior Minister Emeritus of the Riverside Church, President of the Healing of the Nations Foundation. Mary Finger, Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Reverend Earl Fisher, Senior Pastor, Abyssinian Missionary Baptist Church. Shay Jones. Shay? Huh? We say? Girl, they got Shay down here. Let me try to. Me they got Shay. They ain't got Shahida down here. I can pronounce Shahida, but they ain't got Shahida. They must have ran out of ink. <laughs> Dr. Iva Carruthers, come on up here. All right, now, so uh, time for our uh, second panel. I'm going to throw this out uh, here, and I want to get uh, your take. Um, from your personal perspective, define social activism. From your personal perspective, because that that could take many meanings depending upon what area you work in, you live in. How would you define social activism? Anybody today? <laughs> before so April, I guess before, before April fourth. Come on. So, <laughs> so I define social activism very simply. It's acting. It's um, taking some sort of action that aligns with your social, political leanings or behave, uh, or beliefs. Um, I do, as a member of Black Lives Matter, I do believe that uh, s social media discussions and dis uh, is, is activism. I think frontline work is activism. I think standing in the classrooms is activism. Like I define action. So if you are doing something that helps to bring, bring brand awareness, it to showcase awareness, to make change, to transform in any way. I think that that's social activism. I would say that it is consciously living out your passion for social justice. So hopefully you are mindful of what it is that you're doing, irrespective of the form or even the format, and that you are passionate about it because you believe it impacts somebody outside of just yourself. And then that it is structured around the issue of social justice where you have looked at the context of your environment and tried to figure out a way to act and to live such that the environment is changed for the better and that the quality of life is improved. Anybody jump in? Go ahead. Four more left. <laughs> okay. I think it's um, activism. I think it's being involved with uh, an um, issue that you truly believe in. I think it's looking out for your community. It's doing everything you can to make the lives of people in your community better. Uh, I'm gonna let Father Divine impact what I say. He said on a Sunday morning, everybody believe that I'm God, meet me at East River, and uh, I'm going to walk on the water. So everybody came. He said, now, how many of you all believe I can walk on the water? The answer was, we believe it, Father. You can do it. He says, at that rate, I don't have to get my feet wet. I think social activism is getting your feet wet. The second thing he said, 
is that you preachers around here keep on talking about the gospel. My job is to tangibilitate the gospel. So the second aspect of social activism is whatever you say your ideals are, whatever you say your vision is, whatever you even quote King saying, this is my dream, if you do not tangibilitate <laughs> what you say, then you're a liar. And to be a liar is to, s to project with your voice a vision that you're not willing to put your body on the line for. All right. I got two more. Okay. Ava and Bill. All right. So I uh, personally uh, view it as uh, the intentional practice of bringing forth uh, the whole self in order to transform the society in the way in which you believe it should be and to, to wake up with the capacity to feel like you can make that happen. I, I think it's what everybody else said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the key you heard was intentionality, but I think it is looking at yourself honestly and, and recognizing what is your specific gift? And do you use that gift to bring about social justice? If you can sing, sing. If you can rap, rap. If you can teach, teach. If you can march, march. Whatever your talent is, whatever it is that you do that makes other people react, whatever you do that engages other people, that's your talent, that's what you should do, and that's how you should use it, and you should be intentional about doing that. Uh, because I, I, I don't think we all have the same gifts. So, <laughs> so uh, all of us were not given uh, uh, Dr. King's ability to speak. We all are not going to be some wonderful speaker that motivates people. Um, and some people may say, oh, you're not a social activist because you're not marching, uh, some of us have bad backs and bad knees. You don't <laughs> want to march with us because it's going to take you 50 years <laughs> just to get to that bridge. <laughs> so <laughs> it's using the gifts that you have and the talent that you have, uh, and, and I do think religiously, to the glory of God. You, this has to come out of faith. I think uh, social activism has to come out of a belief in something bigger, something bigger than the thing you are fighting against. And you must be bringing that something bigger uh, to the fight. All good answers. All right. Um, what is interesting to me when we talk about how do we affect change, uh, it's always amazing. I've, I've lived in D.C. now the last seven years. It's always amazing to me how folks say, we got to march on Washington. And then it's typically organized on a Saturday <laughs> when ain't no member of Congress in Washington on a Saturday. I keep saying, don't show up on Monday because they don't fly in until Monday night. Come there Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday because they're leaving by Friday morning. Do you believe that when it comes to these issues we've talked about, that we are having marches and rallies which are critically important, but we're not going directly to the positions of power and going to their offices and going to the committee hearings and showing up there in force. Do you believe that there needs to be more action driven to those places as opposed to uh, a mass gathering where, frankly, the people in power are not there? I want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, I think you're describing the contextual realities of organizing. And I think sometimes we get caught up in the idea that mass numbers automatically equate to force, which may not be the case. I'll talk about a couple of cases locally in Memphis. Uh, earlier, Brother Keedron was talking about uh, how they have organized certain demonstrations, many of which I've been a part of, but one I wasn't, which was at Graceland several years ago now. There were six people who shut down Elvis Presley. Six people, but it got the attention of the right people. Uh, not the, a couple days after the bridge was shut down, we organized a group of people to stand in front of the Commercial Appeal 
because there was racist uh, presentations that was coming out of the local newspaper. There was not 200 people, but we let the community know that we would be here Wednesday, this time, come out for a minute on your lunch break, and we want to make sure that the people in power at the newspaper would be seen visibly standing out there so people could put names with faces. So in this celebritized, since uh, Dr. Uh, Forbes made up a word, I just made up one. Celebritized. What was uh, it? Tan ta tangibility. 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 No, but so some of y'all like, how can yeah. I spell that? T A E. No, in this culture of celebrity, though, <laughs> seriously, in this culture of celebrity, I think sometimes we get caught up in the mass movement, which have their place too. I'm not uh, belittling that, but to your point about this idea of force, it's where you show up, when you show up, who you show up with, and who you show up to confront. That oftentimes leads to some of our uh, most impactful exchanges. Because I, I thought it was very interesting, when, again, when I was talking to uh, uh, Bill earlier, uh, it was so funny. <laughs> so he said when, when uh, the, 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 the mayor said, um, oh, I'll meet, meet with the sanitation worker. He said, all 1,200 showed up. <laughs> and he's like, what the hell? I didn't mean all of them. I mean, they, they brought the people to power. And when I see a lot of these mass action movements, they're not going to power. When, when, when the sisters repeatedly went to the Capitol trying to get Loretta Lynch confirmed, uh, me, Jamal Bryant, and J Jeff Johnson, we were talking. We were like, oh, where are all these male organizations? And so we organized a couple hundred brothers to go to the Capitol. And let me tell you something. Y'all, if y'all want to see white folks freak out, <laughs> just have a group of black men show up together anywhere. When I, I no, I don't no, think no, y'all understand. Especially I don't think in the capital, y'all black people don't. Black people don't. I don't think y'all understand. <laughs> they were like, "Who the hell are these two hundred black men showing up?" And literally, what we did was, I, and we said, "Look, uh, we're going to go to the office of John Cornyn, Senator John Cornyn, Senator Mitch McConnell, Thad Cochran from Mississippi, because it wasn't for black folks, he wouldn't have got reelected." And what we did was, we didn't go in there acting a the fool. We said, okay, who is from that home state? They walked in ahead and said, I'm one of your constituents. I want a meeting with so-and-so. Uh, and we met with Cochran. We, and, I, and I led the meeting. I said, and let me remind you, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for black folks voting in the Republican primary. Uh, but the reaction across the whole Capitol literally was like, where did these black men come from? But we chose to go directly to power and not just have a rally outside. Can I? Go I, I want to speak to that. You and I, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, one, I think, we, let's first put it in the context of what are we discussing as power, right? And who? what is the purpose of this action? So the purpose of action is not always about bringing, about like us showing up to the Capitol, us showing up on the front steps of the mayor's house or showing up or shutting down the bridge. Those actions are not always about or only singularly about forcing, using a force or, or bringing politicians to the table. So as an organizer, sometimes it's about showing cooperative power to the people we are trying to mobilize. So if we got 500 people, it doesn't matter if it's on Saturday or Monday, that power that we've shown when other people said, I didn't know that, I, that other people would stand with me is enough to empower us to move forward. Second of all, when you think about stuff like the bridge shutdown that happened on a Sunday afternoon, that's how we got in those offices in the table with the mayor because the mayor wasn't coming to see us before then. So a lot of times that show of power, those 5,000 people that show up, the cap, they're not there now, but that, now they're looking. Now they're saying, hey, let's, 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 Let's cut them off. Let's bring them to the table. Let's sit down. Let's have this discussion. Let's see what we can do before they come to that part of the table. So see, that's a different made, show but you of made power. The, but you made a key phrase, though, that there were meetings after that. But they were. But those meet. We didn't come to the meetings no, no, because no, no. we showed up. This that's, what, that's what, what I'm I mean. saying is those those rallies that you're saying took place on a Saturday. That's a, I'm saying this rally took place on a Sunday afternoon. Right. Right. See, but the issue, it led to that meeting. Right. But right. It led to the meeting. The point I'm making is when we have certain rallies and then we just rally and there, is, there isn't a next meeting. And I, I've covered those where I'll be like, okay, all right, 5,000 showed up, 10,000 showed up. Okay, what's the next thing? And then the response was, well, that was it. And I would, and I would then go, okay, but if you were trying to get this, 
you know there's a hearing, there's a vote. Well, yeah, I don't know. So I can't speak no, to that. No, no, I'm, I'm, yeah. no, no, and, no, the reason I'm putting that out there is because I've covered so many in so many different cities. One of the things that, and again, when people talk about Dr. King, they don't, he said, his, his deal always was, I'm not concerned just about the event on Saturday. What are we doing on Monday? Yeah. And, and, so, and, and, so, and, so, and that's so the reason I asked that, pushing folks to say, we have to do that, but also we have to go to power and be at those hearings. I, I cover city council and county government. And I can tell you how many times I covered the rally, but then when they had the committee hearing, nobody was there. So I think, too, I do want to just call out one thing. I think as an organizer uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, I hear a lot of this, and I feel like there's this thing about perfect presentation, there's this, this, this thing about perfect protest, and there's this, this, like you said earlier, this narrative of history that we are listening to and using that is not accurate at all. But I want to talk about the fact that so often I hear this, this critique of there's nothing left or there's nothing, there are no next steps. And a lot of times if we're organizing on the left, my next step as an organizer is not always about trying to follow this path of power that's already in place and that's proven that they're not doing shit, right? So a lot of times the next steps that we are, that we are advocating for, the next steps that we're moving is about empowering people at the base level. It's about moving how we, so we're not going to necessarily move to the, to the step of talking to the mayor, right? I'm no longer worried about the mayor. I'm now we're talking about building and mobilizing power at the ground, let at the grassroots level. So our next level after the mass rally is to come back in and hear from these people and ask them what they want and how to bring their voices to the front. And it's not always going to be at a city council meeting that's held at three o'clock when most of these folks is working, mm -hmm. right? So just because we're not necessarily moving in that way, just because the rally didn't ma they just didn't necessarily manifest itself in the way that a lot of people think is a singular way, is a singular path, grassroots organizing doesn't work like that, right? So we have to make, we have to give room and breath for the fact that if if that's your space right if that is your space where you say hey we got to show up to these council people y'all show up to the council we're gonna bring our 200 people out right we're gonna bring our 2,000 people out on Saturday and shut some shit down then y'all show up and speak in connection with us right versus it's always kind of just pushing this pull that says one way is better than the other oh no right I'm the thing for me as a person who, who has covered politics that's what what, what happens is I will cover something where they're saying we need this, 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 and then when there's the vote or whatever, I'm in the room going, man, where, 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 where folks at? Understanding in terms of that pressure. Uh, because, and so, and so that, that's what's always uh, bothered me because when you said your next step, you actually had a next step. It wasn't that, but you had a next step. I literally covered events and I asked what's the next, and they're like, well, that was it. And I'm going... Okay, all right, and, and, and that's why. That's why now, when I get phone calls, and and I pick it on preachers, but what happens? I get a phone call and they say, "Man, a group of preachers, we got an alliance. We're doing this here." I say, "That's cool. Call me in six months, and give. I'll I'll cover the six month update." <laughs> You try, Come cover us in six try, months. Though. No, no, try, no, no. I'm saying, <laughs> and, 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 and when I when I when, and every group when I hit them with that, nine out of ten. Don't nobody call in six months because that was the only event they had. And oh, so, well, give me your number. I, and I run three black newspapers. <laughs> and I, no, I'm saying, I run three black papers and I said, I ain't going to cover your, uh, your announcements. I'm going to cover your six month follow up. And that caused some people to say, yeah, I guess we may well have a, a, a next plan. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, because that's what it drove me crazy going to cover stuff. And then there was nothing there after that. I will go ahead. So I think part of the difference is understanding that this is not about event planning. This is about movement development, which means that even before you get there, the real question is not do you have a perfect pathway there, but do you have a purposeful pathway? And that pur purposefulness begins with the kind of strategic thinking and planning that Dr. Emoja's father, Reverend Dr. Starks, presented and left us and preserved for us a legacy of how to do that. If we were to look at the handwritten notes that Dr. Emoja, who testified for us this morning, provided for us of her father's insights in terms of putting pen to paper on the collective wisdom of the people on the ground here in 1968, 
what we know is that they went into a room with an understanding that there was a step they were going to take then, but it was towards an end. They had time step all over it. Who was going to do what? Whose gifts would be used? To what community? To what target? And then throughout it, on those two sheets of paper, the word faith, faith, faith was written all around it, in it, on the sides and the margins. I think that is the plan. That is what we have to, I think, go back to in terms of the Sankofa obligation to learn from the legacy to create the space for us to move forward at this point. Bill, you were at the State of the Union, the real state of our union. We did at Shiloh Baptist Church on Tuesday. And you said something there when you talked about um, the loss of influence with the unions, but also the role that they played in terms of black jobs and black wealth. And so when you heard Bill's suggestion about this infrastructure plan and how we better be uh, at the table demanding our cut of those jobs, uh, talk about what he had to say about that and speak to that in terms of, because that's also uh, an issue. Because you talk to people that say, man, I don't want to hear nothing about those unions, but you've laid out in terms of where they stand today and the impact on black folks, jobs, our families, and the economy. Well, it's clear that Trump wants to appease to white male working folks, and the building trades are a constituency he wants to play to. So it's clear Trump would love to have them at the table. And uh, I think what Bill Lucy was suggesting was that because we have influence over th them, the building trades, that uh, it, it's clear we need to have them say the right thing to give the right message about how to think about this. It is unfortunate, however, that uh, this will likely be, on account of the way things are shaped, a bill more about construction than about transportation. One, because uh, Republicans hate transportation. Um, but for our communities, transportation is more important than the infrastructure. We need more buses so that we can show up to work on time. Uh, we need rapid rail so that we can get from city to suburb on time for jobs. Uh, and those jobs are disproportionately our jobs because if you go in city after city, the person driving the truck, the, per the, the bus, the person driving the train, they look like us. And you know whether you go to New York City or Philadelphia or Washington, uh, the transportation unions represent us. It is unfortunate they are not, it is unlikely they will be the focus of what we really need in this nation because we know that's, that's necessary. We cannot pay the entire United States over. Uh, so this is a, point of leverage because the reality is now the building trades are going to need the voice of black folks on their side in this. The building trades, as Bill Lucy was pointing out and you were pointing out, are going to need the 48 votes of the CBC on their side because they're not going to be enough Republican votes if it's a meaningful infrastructure bill, if it's a meaningful infrastructure bill. I'm not as optimistic as Bill Lucy on this infrastructure. In fact, I don't see where the money can come from because the, the way the tax bill was structured, there isn't a tree and a half dollars. There's not a tree and a half dollars left. And the way they structured the tax bill makes it impossible to do the public-private partnerships that were supposed to be essential to the way Republicans view they want to do this. So I'm not, I'm not as convinced. And, and I don't think Donald Trump can produce millions of jobs. So, so I'm nowhere near as, as optimistic. Uh, I'm nowhere near as, as, as convinced that there are going to be these jobs and we, we need to be figuring it out. But were, we, were it to happen and were we to figure it out, I'm with what Bill said. We, we need to be, be, be using this leverage. And, and the reality for folks to understand is this. When you pick on construction, Racism is in the construction industry, 
let's be clear about that. It's not in the unions. If you look at unionized construction, black people are far more likely to be in the unionized sector, far more likely than in the non-union sector. The non-union sector tends to be residential construction. Nothing against their Latino brothers, but that's a Latino industry. Black people are kept out of that big industry. It has nothing to do with the unions. The construction that's going to come with this big money are highly skilled workers. They got to be uh, iron workers, the, the, the painters who paint those bridges. That union is headed by a brother, the president of a building trade union, the ones responsible for painting the bridges. That's a brother. Uh, so we will have people at the table who will be able to, to be sympathetic. And, and those unions know, because they are the disproportionately black part of the industry, that they need our support. And they know if they're going to continue to have members because of the way the demographics of the country is going, they have to have us as members because they, 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 they cannot possibly stay as white as they are. But they're going to try. Mary? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree with Bill about the uh, building trade, but I see the overture from the president as kind of divisive because the rest of the labor movement was ignoring him, would not accept his invitation. So the, so the building trades, he thought that I can dangle the carrot and get them to come over to my side. Um, the building trades once upon a time, black people could not penetrate it, but now they're out searching for African Americans to be trained, to be brought into the industry because they need us. They need us because the non-union segment is whooping their butts. They're losing membership. So now, they, they have figured out that they need African Americans to become part of the uh, trade. I'll throw this question out to this panel, and, and um, we'd love to see our response. 1973, Maynard Jackson runs for mayor of Atlanta. African Americans were receiving 0.0012% of all city contracts. He becomes mayor. Andrew Young, Jackson again, Bill Campbell, Shirley Franklin, Kasim Reed, now Keisha Lance Bottoms. Almost 800 votes she wins. Atlanta would have had its first white mayor in 40 years. Um, Detroit now has a white mayor. Um, Memphis <laughs> has a white mayor. St. Louis has a white mayor. But you have all these places where you have significant numbers of black people. Are we not understanding the ballot and the buck? Or did the previous folks, let's say not from Atlanta, comp didn't, do, didn't do what they were supposed to do. So black folks said, well, hell, if we're putting black folks in, you weren't making sure we were getting uh, uh, a fair shake. Might as well vote somebody who don't look like us. Let's see what happens. What is your take on the so-called black cities that no longer have black leadership? So, so I think it's a combination of what you described, even with a little more nuance if you talk about Memphis. So on the one hand, yes, people don't seem to understand the polis politics of representation. King talked about this type of proportionality. So and first of all, hold up. For the people at home, what's the percentage of black people in Memphis? About 64, 65 percent. Somebody say 67, somebody say 63, but usually in the mid 60s for the city and in the low 50s for the county. Okay. And that's ahead. important too when you start talking about city county governmental structure. And so uh, I really, I think Tammy Sawyer could talk about this a lot more eloquently than I can. I hope we can hear from her. But I would say, so yes, you had a politics of representation people don't seem to understand. By proxy, oftentimes you have somebody who represents you better if they can understand your plight because they share your, uh, your, your, your um, personal experience. Second thing is this idea of apathy because since 91 at least we've had black mayor in the city of Memphis and people still said 
you know, based upon the contractual things, I think you talked about contracting in Atlanta, uh, even right now, the contracting for governmental contracts for uh, black and brown people in the, in, the, in, in the city and in the county is, is abysmal at best. Like, like, like what is it? Like, uh, I think, well, it depends because, and this is something that Wendy Thomas has been talking about well with the MLK50 uh, project. So MLK50.com, you can find articles that talk about a lot of these data points. But uh, the gist of it is this, that King talked about the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. And so you'll have uh, zero participation or less than 1% participation. And then somebody say, well, even though the mayor has full contracting authority, which means the mayor, if he wanted to right now, could say Shahida is the best dig uh, graphic designer in the country, so everything graphic de design coming through my office, she's going to do it. No bid, no nothing. She could do that. So the mayor has the authority right now, similar to what Maynard did in uh, right. Atlanta, to, to move the numbers quickly. But what we hear is this, we can't move too fast. And then we see these uh, jumbled together numbers that aren't disaggregated. So they group together minority women-owned businesses. No, no, and, no. And, and when they do oh, that. I know, I know that game, yeah. trust me. Right, because, right. Because what they don't want to admit, you, they group minority women-owned businesses, but the reality is you're a black woman, you're in a black category. Yep. Hispanic woman, you're in a Hispanic right. category. So the women category should really be WW, right. white women. Same thing happened in Illinois, trust me. And in a city okay. that is majority black, you should be able to say, we agree to spend X amount, X percentage of our contracts with black businesses. Okay, so why isn't that happening? Who can answer that for me? So again, I just would say quickly, and I don't know, somebody else could probably speak to it better than me. It, it is the nuance of the, the matrix. What you described is right, apathy. But, but, is, but he is got assassinated 50, 50, <laughs> 50 years ago. I mean, I'm... Damn, mm -hmm. what's gradualism? I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. I, I'm just trying to. I mean, no, seriously, I'm just, because and the, the reason, the reason that th this, this is critically important is because, is. again, the black businesses that were created out of Atlanta mm -hmm. began to do business across the country. Mm -hmm. It went beyond construction. It was engineering. It was architecture. It was literally uh, mm -hmm. custom uh, uh, homes. You look at. Detroit, because of Coleman Young, you had black folks who were doing the floor mats and the mirrors and, and I mean, the car freshener. I mean, and so all of a sudden, you, you had that happening, and it, it, it's mind-boggling to me where you have places where we are 50 and 55 and 60 percent, and I'm going, uh, how are we not seizing that power, understanding who's controlling those dollars? Go right ahead. Uh, sure. Go ahead. So... For me, and I, again, I'm not a historian. I can't talk to you nothing about Detroit or none of them places. But I can talk to you about Memphis. And I can talk to you about the fact that what I have seen and I have witnessed firsthand is that we may be the face of politics, but we are not the power, mm -hmm. right? So the shift of power has, has always maintain, been maintained by white wealth in this, in this city. And so when what we've seen, what we see is apathy that happens because we voted people in, right? And I, and I hate to talk about this, we don't understand the connection between the ballot and we get the connection, right? We, we bought into that. We bought into that we voted these black folks in. What we didn't understand was how power works behind the scenes. The things that we don't have access to, right? The money that, that we don't have access to. The fact that we cannot, we can put people and they can, they can come in with the greatest intentions, right? They started with these intentions. I believe that most of the black politicians started with the true ability and thought that they was going to change something till they ran up against where their money is. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a real conversation that we got to have is how do we affect change, politically power change, what do we, and we have to affect the wealth in that, right? And so then the second piece of that is I also think that we have to stop talking about voting. I think when I look up the history of Fannie Lou Hamer, and I think about the civil rights movement, I think about what we talked about, the power of voting, right? We talked about the power of voting as representation, right? So you represented me and what my interests were. It wasn't about me choosing the lesser of two evils, right? So a lot of times you look up and like, who are the hell are these people running for mayor? No, no, no. Who do they represent? Where did they come from? Right? They're not representatives of the people. So people are now saying, okay, they don't represent me. They're opting out. And that is a form of political, well, you can disagree with it, right? But that is a, that is a form of political uh, power. They're using their power. They didn't vote the, the mayor in, right? They, they withheld from the mayoral process. And many of them have not seen a difference in their life. 
right? So you, we can talk about Jim Strickland in office versus Warden in office, but most people are not seeing a direct change from either one of them. So we got to talk about what it really means and how do we then take voting pads just coming and showing up so that we can keep the status quo and how do we change power and hold these people accountable. And that's, that has nothing to do with whether or not people understand the connection of ballots and boxes. It's about how do we hold people accountable for the power and how do we make sure that the power of the people is being is being manifested. Bill and but I, I, I want to add in, uh, I'm all for somebody getting a business opportunity. However, first, let's reflect. Those early efforts, both in Detroit and Atlanta, preceded Supreme Court cases that severely limit the ability to set up minority procurement programs and make them very uh, con confined. In the case of Memphis, if the money is going to Asian businesses, then they have a problem here in Memphis because the narrowly defined interest that the courts dictated in the Richmond case, which was why cities have to do this, Richmond initially said all minorities, and the case got ruled on because they said you included Native Americans and you included Alaskan Natives. There are no Alaskan Natives in Richmond. How do you get to justify a quota for Alaskan Native companies in Richmond? That was what the case revolved around. So the targets end up being race specific. So Memphis has a separate issue. However, what you should care about is who gets hired. I'm all for three black people being part of the 1%. Fine, good for them. But for the 99% of us, the issue is who gets hired. Over that, there is no question. And over that, mayors do have the ability to use their already approved right to enforce anti-discrimination laws and who gets hired and make sure that the process by which public dollars are spent actually are transparent in the hiring decisions so that we see who gets hired. That's where the rubber meets the road for voters, not the three guys get to drive around in fancy cars and have jets. It's whether I get a job. It helps if it's a minority company because minority companies are more likely to hire us, but at the end of the day, day the only reason why we care about if a minority got the company contract is because they're more likely to hire black people. And if we can cut to the chase and just hire black people, I'm okay with that. So we cut to the chase and hire black people. So, 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 so I don't think we. I think, I think the problem is, we view the contracting from the wrong perspective. So these mayors are afraid to go after those big companies and say, "I'm going to take away your money and take away your contracts. I'm going to give them to a black person." And then, like my friend Mark Morial did that in New Orleans, and he found himself under federal investigation for like 10 years. So, so, so the, he was not guilty, let me be clear, <laughs> but he found himself under the thumb in the microscope because he messed with that power. So there are some mayors who can be scared to do it. Mark wasn't scared to do it, he took him on. But mayors should not be frightened of saying, who are you gonna hire? So Roland. Now, I'm, I'm gonna give you this stat right before you talk. So Wendy just tweeted this five minutes ago. She said, Black businesses in Memphis earn less than 1% of revenues earned citywide. Mm -hmm. The city is 63% black. That is a scary thought. Go ahead. Well, I look at most things from the perspective of my expertise as a pastor. Since I don't know the answer why black population in the majority yields white mayors or white political leaders, my answer from a pastoral perspective, yes, apathy is one answer. The second answer is anger. That is to say, we got 65% of the vote, and we got a black mayor, and then we're going to elect a white one. There's a whole lot of folks that are angry about what they did not experience under the black leadership they had. And one of the fascinating things to me is to see folks get so angry with what black folks didn't do that they say, well, shucks, ain't no need of me voting. I ain't even going to vote. So they stay home, and others who are more invested in putting a white person in come in larger number. It's not only that. It's not only anger. It's grief. 
That is to say, black folks have been so dispirited so long and they've been messed over so much that when they get in the intensity of grief, it manifests itself in irresponsible behavior. And they allow themselves either to be bought, so powerful leaders that have gotten dispirited, have lost any sense of hopefulness, end up making themselves capable of being bought and therefore reduce the intensity of their efforts to mobilize the black community to go out and do what they know they need to do. And the final thing in this whole scenario is hopelessness. It's got to be hopelessness to have the capacity to put leadership in and you don't do it. And this hopelessness also is characterized by, okay, you got two black political leaders that let themselves be bought to run so as to dilute the black vote itself. So you put all them things together. I think it requires a multiplicity of uh, factors, but the whole thing is, man, we've been bamboozled by a multiplicity of factors and therefore do not have the strength to do what our best instincts would urge us to do to advance ourselves in the future. That's Bro, my brother, that's we, my pastoral perspective. Yeah, go, go, we got you, you we, we, we gotta name the elephant in the room too. And that, and that's the the the, the token Negroes and, and Negroes who actually think that they are no longer black. So, so so now what happens is look in Memphis you can't get elected unless black folks elect you to office. So the current white mayor have black folks that went to the ballot box, they weren't apathetic or angry. They were delusional because they actually believed that he would be working in the best interest of black folks. Or they just felt like they weren't black enough so it didn't matter. So I, I don't think, I don't want to oversimplify this whole ordeal because it, all of these elements contribute to the matrix of our oppression, which is why they say, and Wendy can say who says this, in Memphis, black people might be in charge but white folks still in control, even though they the minority. Because when black candidates are either bought out or you find one that people believe have the community's best interest at heart, by the time they go up against the white economic establishment that's putting money behind these other black candidates, getting these coons, I mean these folk to run, then, then, then you end up with the diluted vote and so you have black folk that go and put white folk in the office because so they don't so, understand. So, so, again, what, uh, you, so the reason I'm asking the questions about contracts, the reason I'm doing that is because, one, if anybody has actually listened or read the actual mountaintop speech and not the last three minutes, King talked about redistributing the pain, right. talked about boycotts, talked about putting money in back black banks, those different things. And the reality is, if where in the cities where African Americans have been able uh, to make economic gains, it is because you have had black, you have had pro progressive and serious black mayors and understanding it was different with Coleman Young, Andrew uh, Maynard Jackson, and, May, uh, and Marion Barry and those early group of mayors. But if you're literally in cities and you're not getting city contracts, you're not building a black middle class. You're not building capacity. You, so do you, so, but then when you do that, now you have the ability for black folks to fund candidates. Otherwise, yes, when you run, you're depending on somebody else. And I just think that, to, to, again, for me, if, we're coming, if folks are coming back to Memphis April 4th uh, and you're seeing this, it is the craziest thing, thing in the world if I'm sitting there going, how are black folks not getting more of these dollars when they're the ones who are spending the money and putting the very folks in power? Right. Go ahead. Well, I think that I agree with you on, on the situation in Memphis. I cannot see a, a city that's 64 to 67% black electing a white mayor. But I do see that according to statistics that we received preparing us for this, 
that the conditions in Memphis have not changed under the prior mayors. So people are, they don't have anything to look forward to. They don't have any upward movement. The, the, the companies are getting money for, for opening here. They're giving all their monies to the companies that are coming in and not to the employees. The employees are still making minimum wage. Right. They're not even making a living wage. Most of them can work 40 hours a week and still draw welfare. So are, do we have on the horizon in Memphis a Randall Woodfin, a young brother who runs against old guard in Birmingham? He raises his money from his Morehouse college graduates. He activates young voters. He goes to them, talks to them. General election, he comes in first place, runoff, he beats William Bell, and folks go, what in the world happened? How did this come down? Because he actually, he, he didn't worry about really trying to motivate older voters. That's what Bell thought he was going to do. He activated those young voters who said, we now can take this thing over. I'm just curious, what's on the horizon in this city? Anybody? Go Sh ahead. No, no, I, I was Shay, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Shahida Rowland. Shay. <laughs> no, I'm serious. But um, <laughs> I think, so I think. I can't you, call you Shay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's the Jack. I think um, what. For me, I think two things to that. So I have two questions, yes and no, right? So I think we have people like Tammy Sawyer who's running for city, count, city count, county, county commission. I think we have upcoming pe people that are coming to, to, to coming to the forefront for that, right? But I think what I consistently hear is that we keep talking about, I think it has to be a change in the conversation. And the conversation has to change where we are seeding all of the, the, the faults on the 65% and none of the responsibility on the people who are running to represent the people and to, to help change the tide, right? So I think there has to, have to be a change in conversation about that. I also think that we have to get away from this conversation about, uh, especially in the city that's all black or majority black, we gotta get away from a conversation that is good enough just to have a black face in office. So the conversation then becomes, who is willing to run that is willing to work against the, the current power structure and the infrastructure? I think we're seeing more of that, but I don't think we're there yet. And I think what we have to do is instead of having this consistent conversation where we're talking old versus new and there's this gap, right? When we're always, if we hear on this side, it's millennials, y'all ain't doing this. And then on, on this side, it's millennials, like y'all old and y'all ain't doing this. This is where we start to now try to centralize this conversation while we try to learn from both sides and we try to build up, like mm -hmm. you said, this power structure where we say, hey, we, can, we, we have the ability here if we get out of our own way and we start talking about what it means to have power in Memphis. And power in Memphis is not just that political seat, right? It's not just getting in office and, and giving face value and then going in and voting the way that we've always done, right? So we talk about like those statues coming down and we talk about the fact that we will allow our mayor to take credit for that. We'll talk about the fact that we'll allow the city council to take credit for this, for, for, that, for that type of change, right? But most of them have been on the council for 20 years when they were putting their names on the registry, right? Most of them are part of the reason it became so hard. It became, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it became so hard to take them down. So we got to hold people accountable and we got to start having this conversation that's not only holding poor people accountable mm -hmm. for, the, for the issues and not holding the people that they, they, they come to power on their backs. So I'm going to ask, uh, either I'm going to ask you to speak to this before I open up uh, for questions. Um, we talked about power and influence. So when Michael Jordan was head of basketball operations for the Washington Wizards. Mm -hmm. Brought his own people, really gave him full control, all this sort of stuff like that. Then Michael decided to come back and play. <laughs> okay? Put butts in a the seat, they sold out, they made tons of money. But Michael said, I'm gonna hang it and hang him up again. Michael thought that he was going to return to his old job. A Pollard said, no, when they met, they walked into the meeting, and Michael thought, I'm getting my job back. Pollen said, thank you for your contributions. We appreciate it. Here's a $10 million check. Uh, we're moving in another direction. Mm. Jordan got ticked. He was hot. Left the $10 million check, 
on the desk, stormed out, got in this convertible Jaguar and drove off. All those years, everybody kept talking about Michael Jordan was the most powerful player in the NBA. I kept telling people, Michael Jordan did not have power as an NBA player. Michael Jordan had leverage and influence. Mm -hmm. Power, A. E. Pollen showed him power. Because when they, were had, when, they were have, when they had a strike, they were in the meeting, and Jordan uh, lashed out at Abe and said, if you can't make money with an NBA team, you need to sell it. Abe never forgot. He fired Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. He showed Jordan what power looks like. Right. Now Jordan is an NBA owner. He understands power. So it's part of this deal. When we talk about where we, what, what has happened the last 50 years is that a lot of us are having influence and leverage conversations and not power conversations. Right. Isaac. So I would only add one other word, and that's authority. And authority is delegated power. And we confuse the two, including Michael Jordan, including Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. We can go down the list. There is something about power that is in relationship to transgenerational wealth that we get confused about when we don't think that the difference between dollars earned from a job versus wealth accumulation when you don't have to do anything but count your money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it gets back for me to this word of purposeful, intentional, foundational analysis, information gathering, and strategic planning before you step out there. So that you understand that the landscape and that there is a difference between influence, authority, and power. And I'm from Chicago. And I can say that Mayor Washington taught us a lot on his road to the city council and the mayorship of Chicago about knowing the difference and how to appropriate allies in ways where you can organize communities where people become accountable to you and not you accountable to the interests of those who have the real power. And so I see so much of our woundedness manifested in ways that either get us doing victim analysis, where we blame ourselves, or dropping out, mm -hmm. where we don't understand the real power that we have by, first of all, understanding what it means to say we. Mm -hmm. We have something to do with consciousness and identity and an understanding of who we are, who we be. Mm -hmm. And once we can understand who we be, then I don't mind paying 10 cents more Right. for a box of Kleenex, if it's in your shop. Mm -hmm. But we've got to begin to re-educate ourselves about self-determinant, independent behavior that is built around a consciousness of our identity, our identity as people of African descent, who are a miracle people. Right. We are still here. Right. But that miracle is not going to be sustained if we squander the strength that we have in loving and trusting one another and believing that we have the divine right and the divine capacity to have power, authority, and influence if we would only hold each other accountable. All right. It's true. All right. All right. All right. All right. I'm sorry, I was uh, reading some breaking news here about voting rights in Florida, I'm sorry. Okay, questions for the audience. Now you can ask any panelists, even the, one, the pre previous panel, so we're gonna do this here. So I'll take one person at a time, I want you to step up here. Uh, I got ground rules, I got the microphone, I don't need you to hold it. <laughs> I got it, I know what I'm doing. If you put your hand on this microphone, I'm gonna hit you on your hand with this microphone, okay? Uh, so anybody, anybody got a question? Anybody? I ain't gonna ask three times. Anybody got a question? Come on, Wendy. 
been over there tweeting. I've been, I've been reading you. Put your hands behind your back. That's a good sister right there. So um, what do you think needs to happen to have white people in the room when we have this conversation? Because I've been in a lot of places where we talk, we say this to each other, um, but the people who have the power um, aren't here. So um, short of camping out in their yard, what, what do you recommend? Go to the church. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Who, who wants to? Who wants to? Uh, well, but um, I mean, which part of our conversation that we just had? You mean why we don't elect certain mayors or, or any part of it? Any part of it. Well, for for sure, a key part of it is our ability to to remind them that we are essential. So, a strategic part of Shahitas. Uh, strategy and in <laughs> uh, <laughs> shutting down the bridge was to remind them that we are still here and we're still relevant to any discussion they're going to have. That there is a power that we have. We talked about the boycott of the low uh, uh, barbecue joints. We do have a power over them and we cannot treat ourselves as powerless. And so it is thinking strategically about what wax them upside the head to get their attention. And so that's what brings them to the table. What would bring them to the table would be a mayor who understood their authority because the mayor does have authority. And that brings them to the table if you had a mayor who actually threatened to use that authority. Because that authority to, as I mentioned before, to enforce anti-discrimination hiring. That will get their attention because then they understand that I know how to use the authority that I have. So I think it, it is always thinking strategically about mm -hmm. what do I do to remind you that you still have to go through me. And if you're 65% of the population, even though you're not 65% of the economy, and you are not 65% of the economy, just as we were reminded about those black businesses aren't even 1% or they're less than 2%. So you're not that in the economy, but you do have an essential role. So it's to constantly think, where am I essential? Demonstrate it with conviction, and then you got them at the table. Go ahead, go ahead. Normally, the best time to get them to the table is when they want to be elected. They're looking for us. They want us to get out and vote. Then come to the table and see what we have to say. Or, or go ahead, go ahead. what I found out in my leadership is when we effectively inconvenience the game they've got going mm -hmm. and they sense that they need to find some kind of a way even if they're going to feign it, to act like they want to be in cooperation. That's the way it happens. And he, here's why I, I understand your point about before the election. But this is what I've always said, that voting is the end of one process and the beginning of another. another. Yes. When FDR told A. Philip Randolph, make me do it, let me be also clear, President Barack Obama told some black folks, make me do it and we didn't no no the reason the reason black leadership couldn't make president obama do it because black folks were so in love with president obama that they told black leadership don't you dare do that so let's so now that's a whole other town hall we can have <laughs> if we really want to break that thing down and so that's why when I, earlier when i was talking about hearings board meetings things along those lines what happens is we have folks who say I voted. I did my part. No, 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 no. They, then, after you get elected, now we got to keep trying to make sure you're going to do what you said you were going to do. And then if you don't, we're going to remind you of what you said. Uh, and like, and so even, like, for instance, a lot of people get mad at Cornell West they, because of all back and forth with him and President Obama. The day before the inauguration, you can go to my YouTube channel. It's there. The day before the inauguration, Howard University, and an auditorium, Spike Lee's ad agency put on an event. I was a moderator, and it was Reverend Jackson, Reverend Sharpton, Donna Brazil, uh, Amy Holmes, and I'm leaving out one person. Cornell West said, we're going to love the brother, we're going to support the brother, 
or we gonna put pressure on him to do what he said he was gonna do for us. Folks got mad because of the pressure, just like Shahida. Mm-hmm. Folks get mad. Why y'all shutting down pro? Why y'all shutting down freeways or crossing yeah. roads or whatever? Because that's putting pressure on folks and after the fact and not just saying, I voted, I'm good. And I want to say that I think, for me, I think, I don't care nothing about them coming to this, right? So, and I say that because I feel like the voice that's not represented in this room is, uh, that's necessary is not the voice of the administration. It is the power of the people that have, when activated, the ability to move those people out. Right. And so it goes back to what she was just saying about self-determination and empowerment. And it's about this understanding of what is our power, right? What is the central thought and the central thing? So I don't want to, I, 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 I get so tired of that being, you know, in the conversation about bringing them to the table because, or having this thing about the table. I mean, I'm trying not to cuss because I'm a cusser. So, <laughs> but forget they table. No, I couldn't tell. You, I know, I know, I've been so good. But I feel like like we keep talking about sitting at the table until we recognize our own power. Every time we sit at that table, we are not doing anything but moderating, right? We ain't doing nothing but compromising. We ain't sitting at the table demanding and harnessing our power. Ain't no reason for us to be there. So the first step, I think, is coming back. And again, that's because I'm grassroots organizing my power, my, th- my strength. The power for me is in the people, is empowering everyday people to understand what they are able to do, what their dollars mean, what your $20 mean a day, right? And how much power you have in debt and what it means for us to take twenty day, take one day and not uh, pay into low properties on Overton Square. And what does that then do when we start talking about power? What does it mean for us to shut that freeway down? What does it mean for us to shut down Bellevue Church and make these folks and, and tell them what we want and need, right? What does it mean for us to do these things? And so for me, it's more about how do we get those people how do we get people that the, the, these voices in this room, and then we use that power to get those people who are not listening out? That's it. You got a question? You were paying us. <laughs> come on, come ask your question. And then I'm going to do final thoughts, and then we're going to roll. Put your hand down. I know you just come up here reaching. No, no. Sorry. Anyway, um, okay, so we have Black Lives Matter <coughs> movement. We had the Me Too movement. We had the Poor People campaign that's been relaunched. We have most affected people at the grassroots. We have Black August, not just Black History Month in February now. So what are we doing to coalesce <coughs> and build this kind of collaboration? That was one of the things that King did brilliantly. He tried to bring around coalitions. And we know to move power, it takes coalition building to move power the way that we want it. What is your suggestion around strategy to coalesce these kinds of movements with what it is we've been talking about today? I think it's been a challenge to coalesce because folks oftentimes are not focused local enough to have their organization strong enough that by the time you coalesce into a coalition, you (laughs) complement each other, as opposed to somebody basically asking somebody else to just come along with me. And so I think what you're seeing really, or at least it seems beautiful to me, is a lot of individual organizations that are organizing under the banner of freedom, social justice, and black liberation. And I think when people do their job as best as they can, then we organically meet at the crossroads at a Kairos moment. I think I've seen too many times where people have tried to manufacture some coalition and some connectivity and some complementarity that ultimately doesn't exist, and then you have these infights, and then you have all of this you know, pissing contests, so on and so forth. I think if people can, and I was struggling with what uh, Roland said earlier, I'm going to continue to struggle about it, about the big idea piece, the big idea piece. And I think sometimes as people have been trying to dream big, they've neglected the local piece. And so I'm trying to think about what it looks like for people to be so good at organizing their local space, their neighborhood, their corner, their city, that by the time you've done three to four years worth of work maybe, you end up in the same space. Man, some of these people who I'm connected to now, I ain't known Tammy but two years, three years, shape, two years, three years, three, 
She always corrected me. Three, four, four. Not long, but it was her doing her work in her area, me doing my work in my area, Shay doing her work in her area. And when Darius Stewart got killed, just so happens we all, uh, Kedron Franklin doing work in his area, and we kind of sort of coalesce more organically and naturally. And I think that that's the model as opposed to saying, this group needs to get with that group, and everybody needs to come together because some of that, is, I think, is uh, disingenuous. Real quick before I go to Shahida, the big idea wasn't a national idea. Mine is big, abolition. A big idea can literally be in your neighborhood. Yeah. And so, right. So, but it, it's but it but it's getting the re so it's getting people to think my big idea could be my neighborhood as opposed to my street. Right. right. Okay. I'm trying to get folks to get out of just my street and go no the neighborhood and it might take five or ten years. But the point is, or as I always I use this example uh, is. You can't have a strong America without a strong Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You can't have a strong Tennessee without a strong Memphis. You can't have a strong Memphis without strong White neighborhoods. Yeah. North you can't Memphis. have strong neighborhoods without strong blocks. <laughs> strong blocks need strong streets. Strong streets need strong houses, which means you need to have at least one house on that street or one person in one house saying, this is how we are now going to move forward so then it goes person in house to house, house to neighbors, neighbors to street, street block, block, neighborhood, neighborhood, city, city, state, state, country. So that big idea could be national, local, but it's big idea where you are. Shahida, go ahead. So I just, one, I want to push back a little bit on what Earl said. None of that, sh that sh it didn't happen organically. We was fighting like hell. And, and <laughs> That's I think, part of the organic and process. I, so, so I think that when it talks about coalition, it's one of the things that draws me to Black Lives Matter and most of the groups that I work with. First of all, Black Lives Matter does attempt to bring all of those things under the thing, right? So we talk about Black Lives Matter. It literally is talking about intersectionality of LGBT. Of We're talking about the, the women and the gender gap, right? So there's an intentional focus on putting women first. There's an intentional focus on talking about about the ways in which we, the global economy, if you look at the, the 13 guiding principles of Black Lives Matter, it literally says we're looking to affect change across all of these things and bring them into, into one organization, right? We are looking at making sure that all black lives matter and we're fighting it. And so how you end up doing that, right, is, is the chapters, the local chapters, they're then locally we work with other groups. So we do reproductive justice with Sister Reach. We locally, we do other work with C3, we do work with Tammy and Take Them Down. We do work with Earl and MGLC, right? So these are all things. So we're so when you come in to this, what we're what we're working to is understanding one, there is no perfect coalition, and it is not in human nature to be selfless, right? So that means that we all come to this with ego, we all come to this, you know, you don't like the lady at your job, you have to fight and go through every day, you have to fight through the same thing for organizing. And so I think the, the, the biggest thing that we have to do to build strong co uh, coalitions is to get rid of this, this, this thought process that because we're all black and we're all in the same place, there's gonna be no friction. Because what happens is we come to these spaces and the minute there's a little bit of friction, we out. We come to these spaces and we have been uh, you know, we have all of these problems that we've been dealing with for decades, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, for, for centuries, and we come in and we want Black Lives Matter to tell you, soon as you sit down, what we finna do to fix it. No, I don't know, right? <laughs> if I knew, if it was as simple as some shit, we could already did it, would already been done, right? So the thing that's the most important about building is to come to this understanding that we have to meet each other where we are. We ain't gonna agree on everything. There are times, I did not think take, take, take them down now, no one's gonna get them statues down. I say that all the time, because I want you to say the only reason I was there, because Tammy, my friend, I was like, this girl is crazy. I'm gonna bring my ass on out here and go on back home, right? <laughs> to stand up and support her. That friendship, though, developed over the years of us organizing. When I first met Tammy, I didn't even like her. I was like, she's too uppity. <laughs> I'm from the hood. She come from St. Mary's. I ain't even know black people went to St. Mary's. You know what I'm saying? But what I did agree to do, what I did agree was that the purpose that we showed up for, which was fighting for Darius Stewart, was more important than whether I liked her. That's the reason I spend my, it's people here, black businesses here, I think sometimes we think locally, and we think because we have insight, right? I happen to know that back in high school you did this because it's your black business, we grew up together. 
We don't know if the, the man that owned the McDonald's was uh, uh, didn't like so-and-so and talked about so-and-so at school. We'll still spend our money there. So whether I personally like the girl that owned the chicken store right, or not, I'm going to put my money there. And so I think it's really about, like you said, intentionality. It's about the intentionality of saying that I am not going to hold, let petty stuff and petty indifferences stop me from what the greater good is. And I'm going to get comfortable being uncomfortable because it is uncomfortable to put other people's thoughts, to put the big idea first, to put the work first. And also to understand that this is a daunting task. I might not never see the change that I want to see in my lifetime. And that's a heavy burden, right? That's something that you carry with you. When you do this, like there's a difference between charity and as an organization, right? And, and grassroots organizing, because I can feed you at the soup kitchen and go home. I can't, I can't, I can't take this off, right? So if I'm, as I do this social justice work every day, everybody that hits the ground, every black person that I see struggling, I carry that with me. And so it's knowing that ultimately I am willing to put some of my comfort on the line to be the, to do what I feel is right for both me because I want my life to be better, and for those that can't do the same thing. And I think that that's how we build coalition. I think it starts with the power of one, and I think it starts with what we choose to do intentionally ourselves and then how we push that outward. And, Roland, think about what history taught us. You got SNCC, right? Did SNCC get along with, with SELC? Did they get along with uh, CORE and, 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 and all of the other groups, right? And so some of this is just revisionist history where we think all of the black churches were involved. 13% of the black churches were involved in the civil rights movement. But now we're saying, where well, all of these churches at? If, if you do the math, you probably got me, Freddie, Gina, Andre. You, know, you, you got 13%. So, so this, this idea of coalescing today is not much different, just like the conditions are not much different. And oftentimes the, the conditions dictate the organizational principles and the organizing principles. Everybody came together under a banner at a particular time, whether it was the Meredith March or the March on Washington then, and the same thing is true here. But if everybody's, to Shay's point, if everybody's doing their best with their local organizing in due season, you come together at the right time. Uh, go ahead. The, the labor movement has been trying to coalesce with the community groups, the churches, for years and years and years. We build a coalition. We have an issue, we attack that issue, the coalition falls apart. I think part of the reason for that is that we want our issue taken care of. Once our issue is taken care of, that's it. Well, what the labor movement is trying to do now is to build permanent coalitions. We, like you said, we may not agree about everything, you have your issues, I have my issues. But I have to respect your issues right. if I want you to come to the table with me and respect my issues and work with me. So we are hoping that we're getting smarter about how to build coalitions, how to work, do outreach to the community, especially the African American community, and give them an understanding of what labor is about what we do, how important it is to our communities, how important it is to the welfare of our communities, and that if they came together, if, if you had your congregation on Sunday, all those people who were part of labor, I think they did this at uh, Ivan's church, stand up, you belong to a union, the pastors would be surprised at the number of union members that they have in their church. And maybe they would change how they feel about labor unions and start to coalesce with them to help improve the lives of the people in their community. So let me, so let me close it this way, and hopefully I can put this in perspective for the folks in the room and also the people who have been watching on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope as well. Um, and you've heard some of this, but I'm going to say it in a different way. That is, I'm a firm believer in lanes. I believe one of the reasons why we have had chaotic situations within our community is that we've had folks driving on highways and they're weaving in and out of traffic. 
So they're weaving, they're going over here, they're going over here, and it's kind of, and I'm like, no. That's how accidents are caused. So you stay in your lane. Stay in your lane does not mean that's the only thing that you do. But the reality is, this is the thing that you do. I've had people tell me, Roland, if you want to do that, why don't you become an organizer? Because that's not what I do. I'm a journalist. I cover marches. Now, my mom and dad were founders of a civic club in, in, in Clinton Park in Houston. I can organize, but that ain't what I do. I organize within my space, my lane. And so I think for a lot of us, leaving here, we have to decide, what lane am I in? What's the primary lane am I in? So when TV One announced uh, they were canceling News One Now, folks were, folks were upset, it was emails, it was social media, and Folks thought, I can't believe this. And I'm just letting you know, when I was told of the decision, I didn't flinch, I didn't get mad, I didn't get upset. I literally was sitting here going, when I leave out of this room, I'm gonna call this person, call this person, call this person, call this person. Not to vent, not to get mad, but to launch a digital show. Now, I had been thinking and planning this long before that day. So when it was time, I'd already had the plan. And so a couple nights ago, we were in Washington, D.C., and I announced that, on it, that and I was, was going to announce it here, but, uh, but I was late to do it there, that we're going to launch that daily digital news show here April 2nd. And we will stream it across YouTube, Periscope, Facebook, all the exact same thing we're doing now. Uh, and to give you an understanding of taking advantage of existing power, Tuesday night, among those three platforms, uh, we had more than 200,000 views across all three platforms. The Facebook reach, in terms of the number of people we reached that night alone on Facebook, was one million. So, I can't, I'm not going to be focused on getting mad because it got canceled. I'm saying what can be created using new technologies to actually do it. So then, now I also understand that our plan is $2 million a year. So people begin to say, oh my goodness. So uh, ask me, AFSCME, they are our first underwriter. I met with Lee Saunders uh, December 22nd, December 20, no, December, no, I met with them December 21st. December 22nd, he called me 24 hours later saying, we're in. Uh, there's another underwriter uh, we also have, and I'm going to be closing that deal soon. But here's what we also are launching, because we've been talking about it here as well. We can't just depend on corporate sponsors to ensure our projects launch. So as a part of this, as a part of this, we're launching, uh, I, be, I always use Bring the Funk on my show, I Bring the Funk fan club. And the goal is very simple. 20,000 people, I say 20,000 black people, because I got white supporters, Hispanic supporters, Asian supporters, 20,000 people to contribute $50 a year. That's a million alone. Mm -hmm. Now, the other piece is this here, again, understand different dynamics. And so when I was going through this, okay, what's the model? Do we do for-profit? Do we do non-profit? I already have a for-profit company. So we created a non-profit arm. If you look at the Daily Caller, conservative website, Texas Tribune, you look at um, you look at uh, the Marshall Project, ProPublica, those are nonprofit entities. In fact, the Associated Press, most folks don't realize, is actually a nonprofit. So I then said, okay, fine. So that's the model. So if somebody, so the people who are going to be giving, that's going to be a write off. If somebody wants to give 50, 100, 5,000, it's a write off. To create a media entity, and the reason why this is important because if you don't control your narrative, we heard that earlier, mm -hmm. then somebody else will be able to tell the story. So when during the election for in Alabama, you can ask Dewana Watson. They were mobilizing in Alabama right. trying to get young folks with wokevote.us to vote. But CNN wasn't putting them on the air. MSNBC wasn't putting them on the air. I put them on Tom Jonah Morning Show. I put them on TV One. All of a sudden, their phone lines blew up. And then it gave them the energy they needed. Same thing with Latasha Brown and some of the other different people. Put them on the air. 
So by not having a vehicle, then when the unemployment numbers come out and you're watching MSNBC, CNN, and watch those shows, and you're seeing them talk about the unemployment numbers and nobody mentions black people or going to the numbers, on my show, we would call Bill and wake him up. Because <laughs> you would not, they, they don't, they for some reason can't call a black economist. When you talk about so Black Lives Matter was doing, that w it would have to bubble up to a national theme for them all of a sudden to call. Uh, I can go down the line how many stories where that happens. And so my deal always was we have to have a national entity that's covering our stories, that's powered by the people we can control. So if you go to rollingthismartin.com, by Monday we will have all the donate buttons set up. Uh, because literally we were working on it. I was supposed to announce it two weeks from now. Uh, and then my man Keenan got a phone. He got a text in the middle of this thing on Tuesday. I need this up in 10 minutes. Uh, he thought a bomb went off or something. Like, has he lost his mind? So, but you can go to rollingthismartin.com, put in your email, and then the folks are going to get an email. And our goal is to launch on April 2nd. Our goal is to have this. And the beauty of this is we can now take this on the road. Just like we're live streaming this, like we're live streaming on Tuesday other products we're doing. But we can actually now go cover the event. The wreath laying ceremony that took place today for the two uh, sanitation workers who were killed uh, 50 years ago, that's going to be on local television. We streamed it earlier today. Folks national were able to see it, actually Air National. And so that's the same thing. For me, my lane is media. Show gets canceled, I don't freak out. I leverage my relationships. I leverage the fact that I've invested 75000 in my own equipment, so I don't need to add, borrow somebody else's stuff. We can do this ourselves, and we're not having to hope and beg for somebody else to do it. And so go to rollingthismartin.com, and again, this is about covering a wide variety of stories. And whether they are black, whether they are Latina, whether they're Asian, but they're the stuff that you're not going to see on Morning Joe, and you're not going to see on New Day. And the last, I'll give you the last point, because I need you to understand why this matters. So last night, BET had their quarterly show then launched it, Angela Rye, State of the Union. Do you understand, I was the first person to put her on TV. Mm -hmm. right. She hosted my show several times right. before last night. Okay. Without that practice, you don't get put in the host chair. When you watch David Swerdlick, when you watch Paris Denard, Michael Singleton, when you watch Paul Butler, who's now on silent MSNBC, all those people were on Washington Watch, my Sunday show. They won News One Now. W that show diversified the other networks. Monique Presley is on all the networks now. A. Scott Bowden is on all the networks now. They're calling. You, you can turn to Tiffany Cross was just on AM Joy last weekend. Whose show does she do first? Mine. The point there is, if you create the apparatus, trust me, they're paying attention. They're watching. And so they don't realize it, but I've helped blacken the other networks. <laughs> and so if you create the platform, and I've said, y'all can hire as many as y'all want, because I'm going to go find a whole new crop. And if y'all hire them, I'm going to go find a whole new crop. And they're going to look up and like, hi, we got 30 black people over here, because we're going to put them on the air. That's how we actually change systems, because we actually control it. And so we're going to launch this. We're doing it. I'm not looking back. Uh, and other folks got a problem with it, that's on them. But this is how we use new technology to totally change the game. But we have to fund this and not hope somebody else fund it because just like with our politics, if somebody else is funding our media, then just like funding our politics, then when somebody says, I'm not going to fund it anymore and it goes away, then we can't run around and get mad if we didn't want to help fund it ourselves. Round of applause for all of our panelists here, folks. Thank you so very much. Uh, we enjoyed it. Uh, I would tell everybody what's happening the rest of the days, uh, if they don't know. Okay, so on February 12th, about 1,000 clergy and faith leaders and activists and advocates will descend in Memphis. We will be at the Sheraton Hotel as the host hotel and the convention center for the 15th anniversary commemoration of the founding of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. And we are so pleased that we're able to do that in Memphis 
in the backdrop of the 50th anniversary. I wish and I was so here, but I'll be in Hawaii. On behalf of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Board of Trustees, I just want to say we appreciate being received and hosted at the National Civil Rights Museum. And this is but a beginning and a partnership, and we're on board and wish you all the best because your voice represents our voice. I appreciate it. All right, folks, thanks a lot. Everybody who's watching, we'll see y'all later. Y'all have a great night.